Good afternoon from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. My name is Ashley Fortune Isham, and I would like to welcome you to our webinar series held in partnership with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. Uh, they are based out of Reston, Virginia. The NCC WSE Climate Change Science and Management Webinar Series highlights their sponsored science projects related to climate change impacts and adaptation and aims to increase awareness and inform participants like you about potential and predicted climate change impacts on the fish and wildlife. We appreciate you joining us today. I would like to welcome Emily Fort, Data and Information Coordinator from the NCC WSC's um, Science Center in Reston, Virginia to introduce our speaker today. Emily, welcome. Thanks, Ashley, and um, we're so happy you could all participate today. I want to take a minute to introduce Jake. So Jake assumed his position as Executive Director of the USA National Phenology Network in August 2007. Jake's interest in natural history developed as he grew up in Alaska and served as an exchange student in the Australian Outback. He obtained his Bachelor of Science from Colorado State University, Master of Science from Texas A&M University, and PhD from the University of Arizona. Following a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Notre Dame, Jake went to the University of Tennessee, where he served as assistant and then associate professor. Jake is currently interested in how the structure and function of plant communities and ecosystems might respond to global environmental change, including atmospheric chemistry, climate change, and biological invasion. His research spans temperate and tropical grasslands and savannas, temperate woodlands, deciduous forests, and subboreal peatlands. So again, welcome, and Jake, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very pleased to be here, and I really, I'm really, I've really been looking forward to this presentation for some time because uh, it's, it's essentially a chance for me to describe the activities of the network over the last six years. I feel like over the first several years of, of giving talks, and I know there are several friends out there who've, who've uh, been very supportive in the past <clears throat> and very patient as we've developed uh, our vision and our mission and then our activities for the network that a lot of times it sort of seemed like, you know, it was always just a vision. But we've been around since 2007, and so this is a great opportunity to sort of describe, again, sort of where we've come and what our capacity is. I'll spend a little bit less time today on vision, but I'm sure you'll be able to sort of see that in the slides as I move forward uh, in my presentation here today. I do have a fair number of, of, of slides, um, and they're what I'd call information rich. Uh, but I know this has been recorded, and, and I'd like to treat this as sort of a, a resource uh, so people can go back to this presentation, uh, find, uh, find uh, links to uh, documents or websites or whatever to get, to get more information. So I'll move right along, uh, but, I, but I love uh, giving these kinds of talks, these updates, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get started on that. So again, I'm Jake Weldstein. I'm an ecologist with U.S. Geological Survey. I'm also the director of the National Phenology Network. It's run out of the Ecosystems Mission Area. Uh, headquarters office in Reston, uh, part of U.S. Geological Survey. The base funding for the phenology where it comes from the Ecosystems Mission Area and also the National Climate Change and Wildlife Science Center. About one-third of my resources come from the NCCWSC, and I, we bring in other resources from other organizations. Some of you are on the call today uh, to make a total budget for about uh, $1 million per operation. What I'd like to do today is just kind of Recognizing that there's a pretty broad group of folk who are on the call. Some folks, this is sort of your first time to hear about the, the network. Others are, are well established. Uh, at, uh, you might have scientists, you might have resource managers. So I'd like to spend the first few minutes just talking about the, the network itself and what our, where we're going and what our priorities are. Then shift to sort of a practical example and try to show you how we can link science to, uh, to management activities. Then uh, the next section focusing on Nature's Notebook, which is our ground-based uh, observing system focused on plants and animals, plant and animal activity, phenology across the nation, and then sort of a smattering of examples uh, as to how, uh, the current, how currently people are using Nature's Notebook, either the data from the notebook or as uh, infrastructure or capacity for their own activities, um, including uh, a number of organizations we have here online. So just just as a quick recap, you know, phenology, of course, is the study of the timing of life cycle events in plants and animals, but you can also extend it to ecological systems and seasonal patterns of biological activity. It's essentially very easy to observe, 
Uh, it's very sensitive to environmental variation. Uh, when we have a warm spring, we have early flowers, uh, nice cold weather in um, Georgia today and Chicago, and um, there's not a lot of uh, biological activity going on out outdoors uh, when you look at organisms. Um, the interesting thing about phenology is links to populations, communities, ecosystems, and also ecosystem services because the timing of plant animal activity uh, can be, can be uh, essentially lifted up. You can have, think of it in a hierarchical manner, so you can think about how is it affecting a population, a community, et cetera. It scales very nicely from leaf to globe. When stomates open on a leaf in Alaska, changes it, you can measure that change locally, but also over time uh, globally by measuring CO2 concentrations at Mauna Loa. So it's a very, very nice integrative uh, discipline that, that incorporates biological and physical aspects and helps us understand our natural world. But more importantly, perhaps than that, because we're a human society, we need to understand how is phenology affecting our lives? How is it a part of our lives? How, do we, how can we understand phenology to help us think about how do we manage agricultural uh, processes? How can we manage um, timing of when you do uh, manipulations in, say, old fields? So how about how do we set hunting seasons? We need to know something about the timing of vectors, uh, a, a disease, or when to go find invasive species, or how changes in the timing of, of onset of vegetation, say, might affect wildfire seasons. So there's a whole host of different kinds of applications that I'll be trying to uh, describe as I go through this talk. There was a very nice description of, of uh, a lot of this in a very recent paper by Carolyn Enquist et al. in the International Journal of Biomineralogy, a paper just came out describing how we can use phenology and, and uh, science activities to understand resource management issues in the field. So again, probably some of you are pretty familiar with, with the network, and I think what I've tried to do here is just try to simplify um, down to sort of brass tacks uh, what, what we're trying to do, essentially trying to make phenology information and data models available to scientists, resource managers, and the public. So collecting, organizing, describing, improving, uh, delivering a raw and derived data products that we can use in a variety of applications, thinking about relationships with fires in the western United States, thinking about changes in pollen production and junipers in, in Albuquerque region and across the, across the uh, southwest and how that affects uh, pollen production and human allergies. How are we tracking the, the timing of carbon dynamics across continental scales? There's information, quite a bit more information in our brand new five-year strategic plan that's available there online. Essentially, our three key goals are advance science, inform decisions, and communicate and educate. Those of you who are familiar with the U.S. Global Change Research Program strategic plan will probably recognize those key themes. So briefly, what does the network then look like in terms of the structure? We have a uh, broadly distributed group of organizations that are working together um, where, we're having, where we're looking at conducting intensive science, understanding processes and mechanisms at relatively small scales at a limited number of sites, more extensive observation sites where data are being collected uh, and fed into models. We can engage volunteer and education networks and we can understand how this all links together by linking in remote sensing. So really what we're after here is trying to create essentially a national framework for science and monitoring of phenology. And there's no way that you can create a national framework without engaging a whole suite of partners. We have many more partners than this. These are just sort of the, the big logos, uh, if, if you don't mind my saying so up here right now. Uh, but we really value all of the partners who are part of the, the network. Uh, many of them are actually collecting information, data, and uh, uh, contributing to a database, but we also have many folks who are using uh, the data or using, the, again, the capacity, and I'll describe that more in a few minutes. This one slide has quite a lot of information in it, but it's sort of like the one slide that if I could describe the network and sort of what we do, it would be, it would be here, so I decided to show, show it in this manner. Uh, however, if you'd like more detail, I recently gave a, a webinar on, focused on this process of information uh, essentially retrieval uh, and uh, value the, uh, the process of adding value to those data uh, in, in, in this sort of manner. Essentially, after once you've defined your science questions, uh, we're working on providing opportunities for people to acquire information uh, for, depending on which organization is collecting phenology information. We are then using essentially APIs or autom autom web services to essentially aggregate the data into a raw sort of database that we maintain. Here, actually, I'm positioned at the University of Arizona. We, we work to develop derived data products and produce maps. 
We work to add value to those to those uh, to those data products by putting them into models. We work to create uh, inter and integrate data across different kinds of data streams, uh, biological and climatological. We work to, uh, on forecasting. We work on communicating those those data out to a variety of users, and then return that information back to. Uh, the stakeholders who are part of the network. Along the way, the information is stored in a variety of different uh, online data portals, including Data One. We just became a, a Data One member node uh, just a, a few days ago. So that's sort of the fl how the information flows. And so essentially, if you're participating in the network, like Neon is, they'll use protocols that are exactly the same as the standardized protocols in Nature's Notebook, but they use their own system. But with the APIs, essentially data can be collected at a NEON location and it can be spit out in maps almost instantaneously. That's sort of the vision for, for where we're going and how we're managing information. Now changing topics a little bit, after sort of describing a little bit sort of the, the, the network and sort of how, how, we, how we operate sort of conceptually, I'd like to, to actually step back a little bit and talk about how we can use information uh, related to phenology for a very practical purpose, especially natural resource management. And the example I'm going to provide essentially describes how we can how we can think about phenology as maybe changes in phenology as maybe less of an impact, but maybe more in terms of adaptive capacity. If it's an early spring and the flowers on the dogwoods come out early, uh, what does that what does that mean? What is the impact or the importance of that? Is that the impact, or is it the or is it the, um, the adaptive capacity that those dogwoods are showing to a changing environment? When, we, when we're thinking about doing vulnerability assessments, we need to understand adaptive capacity on a species-specific basis or for surrogates so that then we can better understand which taxon might be sensitive uh, or not to changing environments. This is in a very interesting case uh, that has actually not yet been summarized. So I have sort of this uh, kind of uh, big line uh, here showing the relationship as it turns out from a variety of different papers just over the last couple of years that are showing how changes in phenology can be linked to changes in species performance, either population size or abundance or even species distributions. And there are a number of papers that have sort of described this, uh, a number of very good examples for birds, for plants, for mammals. Uh, and, but that haven't, it hasn't actually been really put together. But when we, when we look at this, here's the pattern that's emerging. And it's a, little, it's a little complicated, so I'll walk you through an example here where if we think about an organism and we describe what is this change in phenology that we observe, what we find is that there might be some small changes in phenology or maybe a large change in the timing of, say, migrate, migratory bird arrivals. And what's, what's the trend that's emerging from these papers is essentially that organisms that don't show much of a change in phenology, even in a change in environment, are those organisms that are tending to show decreases in abundance or changes in their species distribution. This is a very well-known example, the pied flycatcher that is a, is a migrant from, north, from uh, northern Africa up into Europe, and the timing of its, uh, its uh, a uh, prey essentially has, has changed, but the timing of the migration is not, and so we end up with what we might call a brittle response uh, or inflexible phenology. In contrast, as it turns out, there are some organisms that are showing lots of changes in phenology. They're very plastic, phenotypically plastic, and those are organisms like invasive species like purple loosestrife that are tending to show increases in abundance or changing their distribution. Now, this is just a conceptual model, but again, there's a lot of information here to support that yet to be summarized. One, one way that you can think about this actually is think about sensitivity. And this is some work by Elsa Cloland and, and Lizzie Wilkovich, who, who I think push this a little bit further by saying, hey, let's, let's think about it in terms of the changes in phenology, in terms of the sensitivity, or say the days uh, of, that an organism changes the timing of its phenology per degree centigrade, some, some standard, some sort of rate. Negative here would be earlier, uh, positive here would be later in the year. And what they did is they went to a number of existing data sets, looked at vegetative and flowering phenology, it's just for plants, it's for native species only, they didn't have enough information for invasives, and they looked to see whether or not there was a relationship, again, back to performance, and again, in terms of sensitivity, so they put it on a sensitivity uh, scale. And essentially what this is doing is testing that, that model that I just described a moment ago. And so again, I'll, I'll walk you through this, and as it turns out, it, it's almost completely supportive of this in this sort of meta-analysis approach where organisms that showed 
earlier or the, and greater uh, phenological responses tend to be those organisms that were increasing in their abundance. In other words, they're adapting to the changing environment. Organisms that didn't show much uh, difference in their sensitivity, didn't show much difference in their performance, whereas those that actually be, were later uh, showed some declines. And who knows exactly what's happening there, maybe mismatch, um, uh, or, or, or what the mechanism is, we don't know exactly, but again, it's very compelling evidence for the pattern that we had seen. And so what this means is we can use sensitivity. If we know the phenological sensitivity of an organism, we might actually be able to predict its change in population size or species distribution, quite important for resource managers. So in fact, we have tools that we use, that resource managers and others use here to understand, you know, what is the vulnerability of species to, say, climate change or or environmental variation. Uh, Forest Service has developed the SAVES uh, tool, and the NatureServe has their Climate Change Vulnerability Index, CCVI. And so these are two tools right now that are being used. There have been a couple of interesting comparisons of them. The George Wright Society a couple of years has a very nice paper on this. And these, these, uh, this particular uh, vulnerability assessment focuses a lot on phenological mismatch. Both of these assessment tools require a fair amount of phenological understanding uh, of, the, of the system. In contrast, the nature search CCVI focuses a lot on adaptive capacity. In other words, those organisms that have that phenotypic plasticity, those are the ones that are actually more capable of adjusting to a change in an environment like a climate change. So really what this means is we need more phenological information on a species-specific basis or if we can find uh, surrogates. We do know, the, know that there's phylogenetic relationships among taxa that help explain their responses, their phenological responses to shifting environments. I don't have time to go into that uh, here in this talk. But essentially, if we can get sensitivity data, then we can understand maybe what the phenology is likely to be and what, what the implications are for population. So Wolkovich, uh, who uh, was on that, that paper I described a little bit earlier, actually said, well, let's take a look at that and let's, again, think about species sensitivity from a variety of different projects that are already out there, experimental uh, data and observational data, experiments where, where we're changing, where we're forcing the environment to change versus in situ observations. And what they found here for both leafing and flowering, there are very strong differences in the realized or the observed sensitivity of species between experiments and observations. And what this means essentially is that we don't know exactly which is the best tool for determining species sensitivity, but clearly we need both experiments and observations until we can determine what's going on. So I hope that helps describe a little bit how if we can understand phenological sensitivity and place it into sort of a conceptual model, we might actually be able to link from an existing understanding of, about observed changes in phenology, the sensitivity to environmental change, all the way back to populations, population size, species distributions, et cetera. So we think about managing an organism at a given location. If we knew something about the phenology, it's sort of a bit of a bellwether for population size, distribution. Genetic adaptation is a, is a component in there, too. I probably won't have time to get into that too much here today, but, uh, but that's always a, an important factor. What I'd like to do here today, here right now, then, is change gears a little bit again and now talk a little bit about how we actually go about collecting and organizing phenological information across the nation. Because uh, until just a few years ago, there really, although there was a fair amount of phenological information either being collected on refuges or parks or collected through experiments uh, through, uh, through academia or um, some uh, uh, historical, historic naturalists, historical naturalists, Leopold, Lewis and Clark, you know, the, the, the list of data sets going on, the Mohawk data set, for example, there's no sort of consistent protocol or standard, no multi-taxa approach, and that's what Nature's Notebook is all about. When we think about trying to accumulate and organize phenological information on a national scale, this is sort of what you're facing. You've got mammals, you've got birds, you've got amphibians, you've got plants, and how do you conceptually integrate those all into a contemporary observing system using a set of standardized protocols, how do you manage the information, how do you aggregate, how do you deliver, et cetera. So that's what we've been working on for the last five years. The name of that activity and the online user interface is Nature's Notebook uh, that comes along with standardized protocols. And essentially what we're doing is collecting information on plant and animal activity across the nation for hundreds of taxa or have protocols for hundreds of taxa that allow folks to track and understand changes in phenology. So I've tried to just distill it all down into one slide, just one slide, what is Nature's Notebook? Again, we've been working on this for about five years online at uh, usampn.org, Nature's Notebook. And 
what it is is the ground-based multi-attack to the national scale observing system. It depends on standardized protocols. Uh, we just had a paper just come out actually today in International Journal of Biometeorology uh, by Ellen Denny et al. describing those standardized protocols and how the system works. Essentially, what we're, we use what we call status and abundance monitoring, where we, you describe the status of an organism at a given point in time, and you can also record the abundance or the intensity, say canopy development or number of, of birds observed. Uh, right now, we have product, standardized protocols for over 900 plant and animal species. We don't encourage people to track all of those taxa, but as you'll see, we provide a central capacity for other organisms to build off of, and so they have requested that we add taxa for them. For example, we work very closely with NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, parks in California, refuges in uh, central uh, Mexico, New Mexico that ask for taxa and specific protocols. We have uh, web services that allow us to share information either internally or, or with external partners. We have several mobile apps, both platforms. We focus on full documentation, provenance. We are policy compliant. We do have an OMB control number for the Paperwork Reduction Act, so an information collection clearance is not required for any federal organizations participating in Nature's Notebook or any federally funded activities participating in Nature's Notebook. We have an extensible framework, and I'll describe that more in a few minutes. We can add tax, so we can add sites, and we can, add, we can in fact, create your own subsite, essentially, so you can track you know, your data through space and time. And uh, the activity so far has produced about seven pubs that use either the data collected through Nature's Notebook or data products produced uh, in collaboration with partners using Nature's Notebook data. So generally, find plants and animals, learn how to, get a, uh, how to observe them, get registered, and start reporting online or on your phone. So we've had, we've had a fair amount of success. We've got about 3 million records. This map is a, is a little old. We've got about 3 million records in the database uh, right now. And so uh, uh, just about a, a 1 million records rolled in last year. So we have increasing number of records uh, that are coming in from a variety of different uh, monitoring locations. This is all of the monitoring locations uh, registered across the, the continent uh, and, and beyond. Uh, although not, data do not, are not provided by every one of those stations. The data, metadata documentation are freely available online. I'll go to results uh, slash data here, and you can download your data. You can get the uh, FGDC uh, metadata, learn about uh, the documentation, provenance, changes through time, that we have quality assurance and quality control. It's not being built in. There's a technical document online you can find on a reports page. We provide annual state of the data uh, reports so that people can get a better feeling for what is available, how can we use it, et cetera. We have data use and attribution policies, and it's a very a science-focused activity. You can go online on our website at usampn.org and use our biz tool. You can plot uh, the locations where different species are being monitored. You can show their different phenological phases. You can layer on climatology. Uh, you can run an animation to find the time periods and the time step that you would like as well. So a very nice tool, and you can also look right down at an individual organism at an individual site and compare it to another individual organism at a different individual site or a different year. So a very nice online tool. Let me just give you one example as uh, one of our partners who's using Nature's Notebook on the ground, but then also thinking about how in phenology information can be integrated across scales, and I'll talk more about that in a few minutes. So this is a, uh, this is a project that's occurring out at the uh, USDA Agricultural Research Service site outside of Las Cruces, New Mexico, near the Hornada LTER site, which is Chihuahuan Desert, and we have technicians and scientists who are tracking phenology of organisms on the ground near weather uh, stations. There's actually going to be a neon a station going in here very, very close, actually on this site. They're using cameras to look at canopy level phenology, unmanned aerial vehicles to get high resolution imagery satellite imagery, and then there are some very rich historical data sets out here on, on this site that had uh, used a particularly different, a different kind of protocol for tracking phenology, and so the focus now is to understand uh, and compare differences between historical and contemporary phenology observing systems and then develop crosswalks so we can better integrate back through time. So it's just one example of how uh, one of our partners is implementing phenology on the ground, cross scale for a variety of different applications. What I'd like to do now is just 
spend a few minutes talking about some example applications. And I've, I've got a few sort of mini case studies here, and then sort of a potpourri, if you will, a smattering of different kinds of applications, recognizing there's a pretty broad audience, but I think the goal here is to describe as best I can some real boots on the ground applications of phonology information, but then also a little bit of extra capacity there that if people are interested in, they can contact us or, or follow up on their own so they can better understand sort of what the what the potential here here is, not only what's happening, but maybe some of the potential. As I mentioned before, we are developing and implementing a, essentially what is a national framework for science and, and monitoring and decision making. And what I'd like to do in the next several slides here is just highlight some of the relationships um, that we have established as a USGS funded activity, but a, but a broad collaborative with some of our key uh, resource management organizations, Fish and Wildlife Service and Park Service. And essentially what we're doing, what we do is, again, we provide a sort of a core capacity and have had a lot of really good communication with folks across the service and, again, allow that core capacity to be, for, for organizations to leverage on that, on that core capacity and, and build programs or activities that meet their needs but that they don't have to necessarily recreate all the steps for a national phonology network and information management system, standardized protocols, et cetera. And it's working, I think, actually very, very well. One of our closest relationships with is the Fish and Wildlife Service Inventory and Monitoring Program, working very closely with Jana Newman on that. And essentially what we're doing is using our infrastructure to create service-friendly uh, portals and taxa uh, and protocols, et cetera, providing apps that are customized, data download tools, et cetera, so that if you start doing phonology monitoring at a given location, then you can extrapolate that out across uh, the, the entire nation or wherever phonology monitoring um, or education outreach uh, need to occur. So we've, we're working on integrating um, not only the science, but also education outreach uh, through the visitor services and focusing right now, of course, on the refuge system, but there's a lot of other applications across the rest of the service. So. So if you were to go, uh, for example, onto that website I was just showing you, uh, one of the first projects we're working on sort of in, in, in building out a relationship uh, and providing capacity for the service and for the refuge system is, is a pilot project. And this is at Vita Oro National Wildlife Refuge. This is, as you probably uh, know, is an urban uh, wildlife refuge. It's actually the first urban wildlife refuge to be established in the southwest United States. It's just south of Albuquerque. It's actually down in an industrial area. It's an old dairy, um, and it's mostly uh, mostly uh, hay fields. But you can see there's a fair value for for um, for birds, mammals, and, and et cetera within within that within that system. Also, it sits right on the Rio Grande. Uh, this is a, a drainage canal along the side of the Rio Grande. But there's this whole system up and down the middle Rio Grande that these are all federal lands that are along that Rio Grande Valley. And so it's important to consider how this particular new refuge, as it changes, it's just, it just very, very recently acquired, um, how, how it changes and how it might fit into a sort of a landscape context. And so these are the key elements that we're focusing on in this pilot, first understanding that landscape context. And as we work to convert this, we uh, uh, work to convert the system over to a more natural uh, system, focusing on restoration. You know, what are the ch what are the changes in phonology? What's the baseline that we can use to try to understand success of restoration activities? How can we use phenological information for resource management, tracking population dynamics and species interactions? Really, a lot of focus on uh, ecosystem services, in particular water and flooding uh, and flood control in this system but also very strong stakeholder engagement. We're just right there on the south end of Albuquerque and there's gonna be a lot of opportunities to get people involved and down there on that refuge as it changes uh, through time. Here's another example of, a, of, a, of, of how we are building capacity with partners, and this is in particular with the National Park Service. And this is a pilot that's occurring actually in California uh, this is the name of this project is the California Phenology Project. It originated from Climate Change Response Program funding to UC Santa Barbara, University of Arizona, uh, the Phenology Network, and USGS. 
that uh, allow that is focusing on understanding patterns of phenology across the entire California National Park system, all 19 units, but with a focus just on seven units for, for the last couple of years. Since 2011, this project has been going. We have a great diversity of ecosystem types here. And so the key questions for this particular project, and there's more information on the project website, uh, are what are the climate change impacts on, on natural resources, cultural resources across the park system? Um, how can we manage those? How can we manage those resources? How do we engage the public in activities through education and outreach all across this huge environmental gradients that we see in California? And then how can we move beyond, move these activities out beyond just the park service? What about our our service uh, partners in the region? What about the California Reserve System, et cetera? There's, so there's a whole host of activities that can occur in the. In, in the state under the aegis of the California Phenology Project that crosses organizational boundaries. And we're getting some very, very nice results um, from, from the study already where we can see very strong environmental controls on uh, organismal phenology. It's focused mostly on, on, on plant species. Here's one more, one more example of how we're uh, using the national framework to, again, work and collaborate very closely with our colleagues and partners, partner organizations along the Appalachian Trail, not just Park Service, but Appalachian Mountain Club, the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, and the communities that are all along this stretch of the Appalachian Trail. And that's probably relatively cold all along the AT today. And first we start, have to start out with uh, pro monitoring protocols. So we produce standardized uh, SOPs, uh, sorry, protocols for for tracking phenology, there's one in the California, in the California region that will be coming out relatively soon. And essentially, the questions that are guiding the activities here are how do we under use phenology to understand resource management and decision making along such a long gradient, such a long latitudinal uh, gradient, and such a variety of different systems? And how can we understand climate change impacts on indicator taxa? So, for example, we're creating custom mobile apps for collection of data online and offline along the stretch of the trail, identifying indicator taxa for monitoring, et cetera. So a, a great potential here, uh, a brand new website that you can go visit and learn more information as well. What I'd like to do now is just change gears a little bit and talk about how, how we, a few other applications, this is one kind of a little bit longer example, it's just a wonderful example of how we're facing these resource management essentially crises this is an example here in the Tucson Basin, near and dear to my home, where we have a Sonoran Desert Upland system dominated by columnar cacti and some uh, uh, some shrubs, mesquite, palo verde, et cetera, and a variety, a very nice uh, diversity, very very well uh, well used saguaro national park east and west, uh, the, a variety of different um, uh, partners in in the region. This focus, this project right now is focused on. Uh, the Catalina Mountains just north of Tucson, and what you see here is it looks like paradise, uh, although this is all invasive uh, buffalo grass uh, introduced from Africa, and it's becoming a real problem in the system that is not at all adapted to fire. It's very fire prone, leaves a lot of above ground tissue, burns very hot, and saguaros do not do well when they are burned. In fact, it's one of the saddest looking things, which is not so good for tourist industry here, let alone resource management. And we have mountains, uh, the lower cloaks of these mountains that are that are essentially becoming invaded by this buffalo grass and this fire enhancing feedback that can create, reach right up into oak systems and up into the Catalinas themselves. So how do you deal with this? Well, it's, a, it's an enormous uh, an, a problem to get out and you know, strap on a backpack sprayer and go out and spray herbicide all over your uh, green uh, tissue of your buffalo grass once you know where it is. And there's relatively narrow windows because you have to time the application herbicide to when the full, when the vegetation leaves are when the leaves are green, um, and that's oftentimes when it's uh, quite hot. So it looks like a beautiful day out there on this basalt rock. It's probably about 110 uh, degrees with your backpack sprayer on, or you could be a bit more enterprising and uh, use helicopters to apply herbicide to the Sonoran Desert Upland to get rid of your buffalo grass. And of course, I'm, I'm teasing just a little bit there, but this is actually uh, being considered right now by the Park Service here, in, uh, the National Park Service, as a tool to manage buffalo grass. It is an enormous problem, and there's been a number of different trials looking at efficacy of spraying uh, across 
use buffer grass systems to manage to manage buffer grass uh, environmental assessment. I think is either uh, still underway or it was just completed, and so it is actually a real potential tool for managing buffer grass. But again, what we need to know is when is the buffer grass green, so we can go out and apply insecticide, uh, herbicide, excuse me, um, or when are, and when, what's the time of seeds? And so this brings me to an example recently described in the paper by uh, Alyssa Rosemartin et al. in Biological Conservation, essentially an example of how we use nature's notebook to go out and track timing of when seeds are present on buffalo grass at given plots, or also the development of the canopy uh, foliar greenness. And so nature's notebook allows us to track when sampling occurred, when seeds were present on the buffalo grass, and there's, you can see there's just very narrow windows of time here in these red boxes where there are actually no seeds present. So there's almost always seeds present. So if you do mechanical control, that means going and pulling it out, uh, you have to watch out about spreading, watch out for spreading seeds. Or we can think about how does the canopy greenness change through time, and if there are thresholds, say 20%, what are the windows of time then when over, over, over time we could go out and actually do uh, herbicide application and control. The issue here, of course, is that there's a lot of area that needs to be treated, and it would be wonderful if we could uh, extrapolate and get a better handle from a much broader perspective how patterns of greenness uh, uh, can be detected. So we need to know where buffalo grass is, essentially, and when is it green. So we've been working with some collaborators, Cynthia Wallace, the U.S. Geological Survey, Park Service, using, again, nature's notebook data, but then linking it up with uh, with uh, MODIS imagery, the Enhanced Vegetation Index, and you know, a lot of information here on this slide. But essentially what, what we've done is gone in and pulled out from a single pixel right near this single monitoring uh, location, same data as we saw in the last slide, but just a longer time series here. And what you can see is patterns of greenness through time from 2010 through 2013, and these are these are 23-day periodicities during the course of the year. So there would be uh, uh, Janu January of 2011 uh, through, this is December of 2013. So you can see a very strong signal in the modus imagery and how well it relates to the in-situ greenness that I was showing in the last slide. So very, very nice tight correlations which suggest that we actually can use modus imagery. And if we go to daily uh, data, which is available for modus, we can get a much better handle on where things are, where things are, are green, and there's a nice, strong leading impact of rainfall on the amount of greenness, rainfall in the blue and greenness. So we can actually couple all these, all this information together to get a very good handle on relationships between the timing of rainfall, the timing of green up, where green up occurs, because rainfall is very patchy in the system. So there's a lot more work to be done here. Clearly, this is hot off the press. Just got in, just came in yesterday. Uh, but I thought I'd like to feature it to show how you can actually uh, work across scale. I'd like to change um, change topics here a, a little bit. Again, those are a couple of kind of longer case studies, and this is I'd like to the set of the next four or five slides, and I'll start to wrap up here too. Are different kinds of applications for how we can use phenology information from Nature's Notebook and combine it, for example, with other data sets or do other kinds of activities with the, with Nature's Notebook as a tool. So this is the, just a quick example uh, showing how, I won't go into much detail here, a lot of information here, but for 2011 and 2012, essentially what we did is we combined Nature's Notebook data that had tree flower, has tree flowering data in it because flowers of trees are important for migratory birds uh, because the insects come and uh, live, uh, get resources from the flowers themselves. And then also use eBird data to look at Tennessee warblers and the timing of their uh, migration through the system through time using eBird uh, checklists. So we have eBird checklists in the blue and proportional trees reporting flowerings from Nature's Notebook in the green. 2011 was sort of a typical year, but recall 2012, spring of 2012, when lakes in Maine hardly froze that, that spring. We had fires in downtown Minneapolis very, very early in 2012, and of course 2013 is not like that at all, but a great shift uh, towards earlier tree flowering, not much change in the timing of Tennessee warblers through the area, and so what that means is that the overlap between the two different uh, sets of organisms was much constrained, and there's a lot of science, this is just describing a pattern, a lot of science needs to be done here, but again, showing the capacity for integration of data sets uh, across different kinds of, of projects. Another application of using uh, uh, Nature's Notebook data, um, this is one that was just published last year in Geophysical Research Letters. Yeah, essentially, um, the scientists 
took a model of leafing for red maple and a number of other taxa of leaf out of leaf out date and uh, generalized it to the region by using nature's notebook data instead of from a single location where the model was developed instead of they they refined the model and improved it across the entire range of red maple and then plugged that into uh, looked at historical patterns of leafing and then into different uh, GCM uh, pathways. This, this is uh, CMIP5 uh, data uh, showing ch potential changes in CO2 concentrations much earlier out to 2100, and with stabilization of CO2 emissions, we have the sort of leveling off of this response. But they also found that if we look at different pathways that are having different forcing, warm, warmer, relatively cooler here, what happens with these higher, higher uh, emissions is that you end up reducing the time that spring rolls up across, across the nation. So not only are you advancing spring very significantly here by, if you think of it that as timing of uh, red maple leafing, that then you also reduce the amount of time that it takes for spring to roll across the, the continent. Sorry, there's a, a lot of information in that slide and this one as well. So again, uh, think of this perhaps as a resource. The way I try to describe this, is this uh, particular set of panels which was published in EOS uh, just a, uh, a few months ago, was essentially trying to characterize ecological drought, the impacts of drought on the bi on biota, essentially, but, but taking sort of a systems perspective. So what we've done is we've worked with colleagues to develop an index of spring called the first le least index, or the spring index uh, ex extended to, to the entire nation, uh, described in, a, in, a, in another paper, and essentially looked at the timing of the onset of spring as an anomaly, so this would be earlier and this would be later uh, relative to the long-term mean, going back to about 1900, for, for the nation. 2012, recall, we talked about a very, very early year. In fact, probably earlier in spring for, uh, using this particular index than any other year in the last 100 years, basically the instrumental record. We can also look at where the anomalies are on a point basis, and what we see here is that's very strong warming uh, um, that, that year, uh, negative 20 days, uh, relative to the relative to the long-term average, we can also calculate a damage index, and I won't spend much time on this, but just essentially a way to understand the impacts of that fall spring. So essentially, spring came very early across this region, but then there was a typical frost, the last frost that essentially hammered the apple crop production in Michigan and Concord grapes uh, as well. We can also think about that in, during the same time period the thermal time to peak NDVI and then peak NDVI essentially just showing that it got warm early and greenness was relatively low that, that year. This was later on in the year. And then when you focus in on the Great Lakes region here in this, in this box, essentially this is the line here showing the very early spring in 2012 uh, relative to the previous uh, average of the previous 10 years. And what you get is a very early spring that may cause and exacerbate drying later in the year, and you end up with a summer drought that you can measure on a regional scale. So again, maybe there are some, there's a lot of science, there's a lot of uh, work that still needs to be done here, but some very, very compelling patterns that link changes in organismal activity all the way to something like uh, uh, drought, uh, at regional scale drought impacts, ecological drought. Just uh, starting to wrap up here, but you can see I've sort of been scaling, scaling up a little bit. Essentially, what we can start to do with phenological information, too, that's so tightly linked to climatology, we can understand through the fingerprint of the biotic response, we can understand climate change impacts and climate variability impacts. This little GIF that hopefully you're seeing is showing changes in the spring index that I was showing and described in the last slide spatially through time from 1950 until uh, uh, until just recently and essentially you can see lots of variation from year to year there's lots of detail there but we're working on developing tools and we'll be showing these data out through the NPN website so this will be a, a data product that we're working on and then you can do things like looking at differences in onset date uh, between 2013 and 2012 uh, just doing comparisons here and think of the blue as cool spring relative in 2013 compared to 2012. So we can see these large uh, patterns that show up on a continental scale. So this is one of the things we'll be working on to deliver phenological information. It's very important though to put it into the context, again, a continental scale context. I won't spend much time on this. This is from Bill Hargrove. He, he took modus imagery and defined the 50 most different phenological ecoregions 
across across the U.S. and essentially creating what we call regions of synchrony. And so that if we know that there's a particular region that responds relatively similarly, then we can define a phenological functional type, perhaps focus sampling within those regions and, and do scaling. We're working with a number of other, across a number of different scales here as well, where we're working with a variety of different uh, stakeholders and partners, including the Climate Science Center, the North Central Climate Science Center, and uh, uh, the Phenocam Network out of Harvard uh, University to implement phenology monitoring. This is the Phenocam putting out cameras to track phenology, and the North Central CSC is providing cameras for this region where you can see there's, there's quite a hole. I don't have time to get into that much more, um, but the Phenocam website has a lot more information. We're also focusing on communicating and educating our, uh, the American public. Uh, one way is to actually produce indicators. Uh, so there is a phenology indicator, the spring index that I was talking about a few minutes ago, is actually a global change indicator in, uh, in the EPA report. And we're working very closely with the U.S. National Climate Assessment, the U.S. Global Change Research Program, to produce an indicator for their new indicator system as well, focused on leafing and blooming dates from data collected in Nature's Notebook. We're working closely with some of our other partners on strengthening tribal uh, nations, providing capacity for tribal nations where we have education and outreach activities that can be implemented, for example, at uh, Haskell Indian Nations University, where we're implementing a phenology walk or um, off of a concept of phenology trail, similar to the Appalachian Trail, where we can focus on culturally significant plants and they can, they can use the infrastructure of Nature's Notebook for phenology monitoring, education, outreach, understanding, et cetera. Working very hard too, <clears throat> keeping in mind the fact that we have a, a, a new generation coming along and we're focused on getting people outside and engaged in the, in the, in the America's Great Outdoors and so again, Nature's Notebook is a fantastic opportunity to engage uh, the new generation. So just to just then to that wraps that wraps it up. I'd like to just point out that we, we do manage a couple of websites. The the National Phenology Network.org, USANPN.org, is a place where where it's the it's the entree to the network. Get information, find out information about education outreach, get partnered, etc. But we also have Nature's Notebook, which I've mentioned several times. We have a separate website for that that we host that allows people to come in and do phenological monitoring. But the two work very, very closely together. And, and really, it's a, it's a very exciting time because this is capacity that can then be essentially almost franchised out to some of our natural resource partners and for science and society. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Jake. Um, we did have a couple come in during the, the presentation. The first one was from Carl Ford. He says, how does NPN differ from Project Budburst? Okay, thanks, Carl. I appreciate that. Uh, there are actually a lot of other organizations that are doing phenology monitoring uh, for a variety of different taxa. Most of them tend to be very taxa specific. The Florida Bluebird Society, for example, a great great partner, focused on, uh, focused on bluebirds. Uh, the Project Budburst is focused on plants. Um, we're, uh, of course, a multi-taxa organization. We focus on providing sort of programmatic capacity from a science-based perspective. So essentially, when we encourage people to get involved, um, we are focused on documenting every single aspect of essentially what we do through the protocols, uh, documenting them provenance, documenting terms of use, et cetera. And we encourage people to get involved for, for, long, for essentially longer periods of time. Essentially what we're after is a, a you know, 30-year data set. We're a 30-year program after a 30-year data set that we'll need to understand climate change impacts. And so that's probably uh, one of the, the, the key differences, and we can, we can talk a bit more about that later on. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, the next one is from Bruce Marcotte, and his question is that he worries about the errors of identification and other information when crowdsourcing databases from citizen scientists. How are you uh, calibrating, verifying, and vetting contributions? That's a great quest. That's a great question, Bruce. I, I appreciate that question as well. That that is an issue with all aspects of essentially crowdsourced type of activities. I'd just like to point out that you know about half the data in our database right now are coming from uh, prof professionals, essentially people who get paid to uh, you know collect phenological information, or they uh, they organize others to collect phenological information for them. So, but but it's and and, ac and across all different user groups, it's very important to have uh, quality assurance and quality control built in. So we describe that in that uh, technical documentation on the quality assurance 
uh, uh, and quality control of our, of our data. Essentially, quality assurance is working to prevent people from making errors uh, where we can. So we, you know, control the control fillable fields. We provide descriptions, uh, uh, standardized descriptions of what to what to look for. We provide images uh, where we can. We provide descriptions of where organisms are. Uh, try and we don't certain things. We don't allow people to enter the dates in the future, et cetera. So a lot of quality assurance built in. Quality control is a lot harder. It's it's once you have a piece of information, uh, determining the the potential you know quality or the validity of of, of those data in a, in a post hoc way. We've been working on implementing that. Uh, we're actually working very closely with Neon. Uh, we have a data products working group that's focused on identifying best practices for quality control of, of, of data. You know, once you have a piece of data and you can, and we would deliver both raw and tagged data sets that, that people can that people can use. We're also using a number of other ways to compare, uh, you know, to determine uh, uh, quality of information or the ability of people to identify phenological phases and enter the data in. Um, for example, we have a paper that's right now in natural science education. It's in revision there where we actually compared uh, professionals versus members of the public uh, uh, who, are, who are trained volunteers, essentially, uh, um, to collect and identify phenological phases. And actually, the, the, it's pretty good. It's about 90% um, rate of, of, of similarity. So, so we feel like the, the data are probably pretty good. There are issues with species identification. Some might say it's a red maple, it could be a silver maple, et cetera. Those will always be hard to do. So, but we'll be working on incorporating tools that help us separate those out uh, through time. I think the proof in the pudding might be the papers that have come out. So um, if you get papers in global change biology, geophysical research letters, earth interactions, uh, to us, so it's like, okay, you know, people are, people are actually able to go in, download the data, work with the data, knowing what the caveats are, and then come up with, come up with a very nice regional to national scale science activities. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question from John Cobb. It says, can you speak about the ability to use these repositories programmatically through APIs or other mechanisms? Sure, John, that's, a, that's an excellent question. We do have uh, web services. We are not quite um, perhaps what you might call service-oriented architecture, but, but, very, but very close, uh, particularly with an online system. By having APIs and web services for data in or data out, we can easily <clears throat> share uh, capacity for other organizations to build on our standard protocols. In other words, we can deliver our standardized protocols through an API. Um, we, can do, we can receive data uh, through an API. And I, I failed to mention when there was an earlier question about other, other different projects that are out there, sometimes we can, we're, we're working with a number of organizations right now to, to essentially ingest uh, their, their data into our database. But if the protocols are quite different, that takes um, an, an enormous amount of work, and so it requires a crosswalk. So it has to be a crosswalk table, uh, sometimes even for, from one data set to the next. But that's most readily done through APIs. So one, for one example, a uh, contemporary example is when Neon collects phenology information using protocols that are essentially, you know, they're exactly the same as, as what we use in Nature's Notebook, then through APIs, their data essentially become immediately available through the Nature's Notebook uh, online user interface, the database that I was showing you there. And so we can start to actually integrate different data sets. There's a lot of different kinds of protocols out there, all the way to Lewis and Clark's diaries, you know, uh, or Leopold's uh, data. And, and so integration is a, is a very difficult activity, but the APIs will certainly facilitate that. We, we run our mobile apps off of the APIs, for example. Does that answer your question, John? Well, I, I hope so. If you need more info, let me know. Uh, yes, it just took him a moment to write it. Um, yep, he said yes. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, the next question is from Carrie, and she says, are phenological observations made only for terrestrial species, or are they also made for aquatic species? We have, um, we have phenological protocols available for plants and animals, and within animals, Birds, reptiles, amphibians, mammals, oh, uh, insects, and aquatic organisms. So all of the Western uh, fish, uh, salmon, for example. We don't have a lot of taxa. We've been focusing mostly on uh, terrestrial plant observing. 
that's a little easier. Uh, NOAA has a lots of phenological information on, on mar sort of marine uh, phenology. There are issues with, um, with understanding and or finding phenological information from, say, the marine realm uh, because different terminology is used. And so we're working a little bit on information architecture, say, with, with OBIS, uh, to try to understand how, how one might go in and find good phenological information on, say, walrus or uh, fish runs or phytoplankton or shad, uh, et cetera. So, so, yes, we do have protocols for a great variety of taxa, but in part it's driven a little bit by our, by our stakeholders and what, what their particular needs are, and we haven't got a lot of, say, uh, aquatic uh, uh, collaborations going quite, quite yet. If I can just uh, change topic here, I did see there was a question about planning to extend this to Alaska. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, Alaska is part of the, you know, we've got uh, a part of the Nature's Notebook. In fact, you can, anybody can participate in Nature's Notebook uh, as long as they have the species and can identify the species uh, no matter where they are. So we have data that are rolling in uh, or, you know, sites that have been registered at least in Greenland and the Micronesia and, uh, and certainly Alaska, U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, Guam. So the, so the system is relatively broad. We've got a number of monitoring sites in Hawaii, uh, and there's not a, lot of, not a lot of data rolling in from those regions, although there is a paper currently in review at Global uh, Biogeography um, on, on some of the patterns seen in Alaska, and a recent paper uh, by Eugenie Uskirchen, who was looking at mo modeling the phenology in, in the Alaska Arctic and used uh, Nature's Notebook data to improve her models. So, um, so that's uh, so we're so we're certainly uh, nationwide, and um, are also working with other uh, national phenology networks uh, in a variety of ways to share information or to share capacity. The Swedish phenology network. We've talked to Brazil. We're talking talking to the Bhutanese, which is sort of exciting uh, about phenology monitoring. The Turks uh, and Doga Defteri, which means Nature's Notebook in Turkish. So we're having a lot of fun uh, working with the international community as we expand out. And of course, Canada and Mexico are our key uh, partners, and there's a fair amount of interest, but we haven't really sort of moved to that next level of you know, strong intellectual, intellectual, international intellectual collaboration, data sharing, uh, et cetera. So there's some, certainly some capacity for that there. All right, great. I'm not seeing anything. So I just wanted to say thank you, Jake. That was a wonderful presentation. We already have had some comments that said um, what a great overview, and thank you for inspiring them to get started. Great. We look forward, we look forward to working with anybody out there. Thank you very much. <laughs> I really appreciate it.